And the one thing I want to go, I want to go specifically to Sindler and your specific uh, problem that you're solving right now, because I want you to take me to the technology. Tell me what it is that you've been able to achieve. Um, perhaps point out a couple of things for me that I can have a better understanding of what it is that um, you want to bring to market now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the, I will start from the problem that typically uh, that I've articulated in a couple of other uh, you know, uh, responses to you. Um, like I said, the robotic arms today are just machines with six motors where you take a joystick, ask them to go to this particular position, record this position, move to another position, record this position again. Right? The assumption is it will keep repeating this action again and again and again within 20 micron of precision. So whenever it comes to location A, it gives a trigger to a custom engineered finger, which they call it as gripper. And then when you give a trigger, the assumption is it will close its finger to whatever that you have pre-designed, right? To the extent that you have pre-designed. Assumption is the part is right here. When you did this, it attaches itself to the part and then it comes to the location B and then you release it, it leaves the part. Right? This is the assumption. Now, when even a slight tilt happens here, the gripper will come close to the same extent, move but without the part, which it doesn't realize. Now, even if it realizes it doesn't have a part, it doesn't know how to adjust and then go pick it back again. Starts with a very simple problem, right? But every task like this is, whether it's this small a tilt or this much of a tilt or orientation or whether the part is being present from one location to the other location, the system has to adjust and adapt and then be able to hold. This is your realistic problem that you have within even every manufacturing or any assembly. And just within this alone, I think if my numbers are right, uh, US pays around $1.3 trillion of wages in just manual labor alone for manufacturing sector uh, or or the holistic of the manufacturing sector for the case. That's a lot of, that's a lot of unautomatable tasks that exist. And what do they predominantly do today? They're not very highly skilled like operating a lathe machine or operating a... These are all CNCs. They have been taken over. What are they doing today? They're feeding these parts to the machine, which is they're moving these parts from one location to the other location or they are picking two parts and making them mate with each other. This is what the primary task is. Now, vision today doesn't scale because the assumption with vision is, hey, you take a color image of the object that you want and then understand the color image with the patterns it actually has, then probably use it to construct depth or other information and so on. So this is the basic understanding of vision. Now, if you don't, if you cannot identify, you cannot make the system go manipulate an object because I don't know where to go. Putting camera is the only way by which you can make them dynamic, but the bottleneck for the camera is it has to identify at every point of time. Now, what does it identify? It identifies a color pattern. What color pattern will you be able to identify in a mirror finished object? A mirror has no color. It just reflects. If a fine, shiny metal part has been present in front of it. This is usually a litmus paper test for AI systems. Second thing is, if it's a translucent object or you have a wrapper, plastic wrapper on top of it. Amazon Robotics has one of the problems that they quoted to us, uh, which are still solving. Uh, one of the things that our camera is really good at. When they have a bunch of objects put inside a polythene bag and you have to go pick them, then the system fails because the system is not able to recognize that part because you're wrapped inside a cover. It has a lot of reflections around it. You're not seeing that object that is there inside. How do you go handle them? How do you know how much to go put the pressure? Where to grasp? Which way to grasp, right? So, and you can't go about training this again and again and again and again and on top of it. On the other contrary, a human baby, you present this part, it may not know what this part is, it'll go grab, right? It'll put it in small or throw it out, right? He doesn't even know that these two are attached together as a part. He didn't need a vision and then so much of those training for it to go grasp. The moment it is able to control its hand, it'll pull your spectacle, it'll pull your hair, it'll, it'll play around every, with everything, right? They are able to use their vision without knowing what that object is and then go, hey, they didn't have to know what that object is. This is called as intuition, right? These are so many layers of information that your brain processes before it, you are able to recognize what that object is. So just to give a contrast, so the layer where you are, the portion where you are realizing and labeling an object, which we call as intelligence, usually, is at your frontal lobe in your brain, right? The whole occipital lobe that you have from your eye all the way till here 
the amount of processing it actually does is humongous is the reason why we close our eyes whenever you have to smell a rose or whenever you're tasting something or when you're listening to music or you want to touch something that is very soft the first in instinct that happens is to close our eyes because you're relieving the neural activity for the rest of the other regions to process the information with more details right that's amount of computation more than 55 percent of your brain at any given point of time is to process visual data or visual information or any of your processing that you're allocating for now, how much have you oversimplified? How many of those layers that are missing? And that's the thing that we are actually building. A sentience before intelligence, right? Those missing layers, which are more intuitive for you to make sense. You're not looking at objects that you call as a keychain or a key. You're looking at some contours that are pickable. Now with that, you define what an object is, right? So this is what is the first aspect that you have to bring into the robotic arm, where even it is an untaught, unknown position, they know how to go handle, pick it, then explore to bring it to a point, rotate and explore to bring it to a point which is familiar to them. Without this, they can't act. And most of the cases, they become dumb and then still because they don't know what to do, right? Breaking them from this dilemma is what we actually build as vision, right? And to do that, we have to break the paradigm of vision. Our, hum our, our human eye does not see color first. Our human eye, which we call as a fourth layer, uh, which is called as on of ganglion, essentially sees motion first. And stereo vision, unlike how the way today, the way we use it for depth, the way we construct depth in machine vision is either it's basically patterned lights, uh, which we call a structured lights that we project. And then we use them to use their offsets to construct depth, right? That's how the system is actually built, uh, which is a very, very old mechanism from which the modern ways of your Intel real sense and everything is a 2D pattern that you project, right? Because color is very hard for you to use for stereo vision, right? When we do stereo vision, what we do, we have a right eye and a left eye. Let's say I have seen a circle in my left eye. I search for where is the circle in my right eye and how much has it offset between these two eyes. And that's what I use for constructing depth, right? Except what appears as circle in your left eye appears as oval in your right eye. Now, how do I match them? If I don't know what object is in front of me, right? There goes the dilemma. You needed the depth to identify an object, but only if you can identify an object, you can construct the depth. And color is very unreliable. Reflections and patterns and surf environmental lighting are highly unreliable. Then what do we do? Instead of depending on external lighting, let me do my own lighting and projection. And that's what we call as the, the structured light approach to construct depth. But human eye use, doesn't use any of this. In fact, human eye uses 18 different cues of depth, out of which six are very, very primitive and primal. For us, not uh, primitive is a wrong word, primal. For us, uh, which is very instinctive, inbuilt. And then uh, we have uh, probably around 12 different cues which we use to, where we learn and then construct the depth, which is very contextual. Like even with one eye, I can say that there is far away because I know the context. Your color is a very, very subjective interpretation for human eye, right? That's why we had the blue, black and the gold, white illusion in the internet. The whole internet was split into two saying that that dress a dress that was either it was a blue and black dress or a white and gold dress, right? That illusion is because human brain is, you know, interpreting color very, very subjectively, contextually, like right? simple example. If I ask you, what is the paint color for it? Is it, is my roof all painted with the same color? You would say yes. And what color is it? White, right? But for a machine, if you ask, that is a brighter white, 255. And I'll say that this is a, let's say this is, this is basically, let me see if I can get, yeah. That's a gray, right? So this is how this is how machine will interpret. These are all varieties of different colors put together. It's not one single continuity. That's an yellowish white, and this is so and so. And how does it all stitch together? And we are taking that as a foundational information, trying to put together an object. That's a wrong, that's a wrong approach. And we can keep training millions of images. You can still not, you know, exhaust it. We are we are missing certain approaches in those cases. These approach difference is what uh, we build. And one of the primary things that we need is a camera that can see motion, more than motion, it's change, and associate that with the color and the intensity that it actually sees, and be able to construct depth the most natural way and adaptively the way human eye actually does. So uh, I also want to delve a little bit into why this uh, depth is, uh, why we say there are more cues for depth. Because each scene, one, when I, tilt, when I look from one angle to another angle, the cues that I need to construct the depth will be very different. It need not be from color pattern. It could even be from autofocus or it could be from convergence. 
or it could be from motion right motion is one of the primary cues by which we construct depth um how do i say that the reason why your you know your hen does this right the when they move they do this the you know the movement of the head that they actually do that's that's because they take one still and they take another still and they stitch that's a stereo vision in time that they actually do right very similar to that if you see your 2d cartoons to create an illusion of depth the character moves faster the trees moves little slower the mountains move even slower that creates an illusion of depth this is one of the belajulis uh, 1963 i think he did win a nobel prize i'm not sure i might be wrong but if i pronounce his name right it's bella julis uh works on this principle of how stereo vision happens out of uh you know even in an unknown patterns just because you put out a stereo you can construct depth the same thing we do it for motion and then we can construct depth out of the same system so motion is the primary cue from which the depth comes and then also your auto focus auto focus is not to focus on to particular we think it's a filter to you know help us sharp see images very sharp but actually it uses the blur for depth construction that's your first cue to understand what is in the front what is behind then your convergence is the way by which you construct depth so these are all some basic capabilities that we inbuilt into the camera and then the layers of all the you know sophisticated algorithm that's supposed to come more to make the system intuitively adaptive about objects that it has never seen before so the camera system that we build when we put it on top of a robotic arm even an unknown object so what we do is we just you know um, showcase our product in uh, uh, robotics business review in the boston show uh, this may uh, what we do in the expos is to just put a tray and then let people bring their own objects and then put it there right they will put their keychains which the robot has never seen before without any effort no specialized lighting no lighting variations simple like a normal human eye it goes and grabs that part right now you need to know how much force to apply how to grasp them where to approach it from all very instinctively right without any prior training so this is the basic capability that we built now with this capability we will still need engineering we will still need uh, training and so on so forth for but for what to be able to train the dog the robot to do a task with it oh i picked a pen but it doesn't know what it has picked it needs to know that it's a pen it needs to know that you can put your finger on the top and then pull out the cap or press a cap on top of it so these are the things that you can actually train but it becomes much much easier for you right way more easier for you you are not like you don't need millions of images it starts instantaneously learning those systems so we are shrinking what usually takes 15 to 24 months for a customer to set it up as a system into just 3 months some of the deployment that we done in denso is within a month but typically a 3 month period most probably because today um our our ui is not that convenient uh, you have to still program and do all of that so brings down to 3 months makes one robot system completely scalable between multiple different objects you can just repurpose the same robot from one task to another task and what we call is what we envision to bring is a transformation that laptops brought for data processing you have seen this uh, fam famous uh, video of in the desk how many objects used to be there in 1980s how many devices used to be there in 1980s how it has all shrunk to one laptop one hardware and any up, any variation of data processing that you want to do it's just an just a software away right imagine the same scenario for object manipulation in the factories everything is just one form factor of a hardware and it's just a software away to make it pick a bolt or a, or assemble a car or assemble your mobile phone all of this is just a software away so this is what we envision is what we think as a capability that we can bring and the crux of it is the vision for us wow you you said that you, this is just the basic thing that the basic task that you are solving for it's not basic at all to me it's it's fascinating